Welcome back to the Crash the Pond podcast. It is a Monday, June 12th edition of the show. And this is a special show. We're, what, two weeks away from the draft, something like that. And joining us today from Elite Prospects is Mitch Brown, who we had on last year and and very excited to have on again this year and, and dive into what should be a fantastic draft. So, Mitch, uh, thanks for coming on, and how's it going? Ah, oh, not too bad. I'm pretty excited to be back. You chose a great time to start this just as the Nuggets won. I was <laughs> when you guys were talking about it backstage, I was on like a solid minute tape delay. So you're like, oh, they won. <laughs> Oh, and I'm, I'm sitting so there, and then, wow. and then there's an in-down play, and then Kyle Lowry gets the ball. I'm like, oh, so he missed this for sure then. <laughs> oh, man. I'm wow. so sorry. Wow. I hate doing that to people because I hate when they do that to me. Oh, man. So, Mitch, That's... what you're saying is you now have a vendetta against Felix forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna say some crazy stuff here about Adam Fantilli. Just yeah. Okay. Like, you're, okay, you're, good. You're, you're going to have to, yeah, get one back. Uh, but, <laughs> man, I did that to someone else earlier. Now I just... Feel like this is crushing for me, but uh, we'll carry on. We'll move forward. We'll, we'll try to try to make amends here. So, Jake and I have been discussing the the draft here for, you know, just kind of what this will mean for the Ducks and who they might get and this and that. But we only know so much. You know, we only really read what other people write about it. We only really get to dive into other people's work. So this feels like a good opportunity to actually talk to someone who who does the work who actually knows what they're talking about in, in way greater detail. So I think we should just not waste any time and, and really dive into it here. Mitch, the Ducks have the second overall pick. And let's just start with a very simple question. Who should the Ducks select at the second overall pick? Well, so they have a choice here between Matt Vimichkov, unlikely, Leo Carlson, and a dude named Adam Fantilli, who is the best prospect since Jack Hughes, not named Connor Bedard. And so for me, the choice is pretty evident. You pick Adam Fantilli. Yeah, I think that that's a, yeah. that, that's a very reasonable take. Here's, here's where I want to dive in a little deeper, though, because I think that maybe you don't, maybe you're not on this side of the, of the ledger, who knows. But I think that I, I agree that Fantilli would be a fantastic pick, would be my pick and is a great player. But how big of a gap do you think there is between Fantilli and say like a Leo Carlson? Because I yeah. feel like Carlson has kind of been the victim of, of Fantilli's stock rise for a lot of people. How do you differentiate those two and, and how big of a gap is there between those two prospects? Well, I think with Carlson, you're looking at say top line play driver esque player might not, ever, might not ever win any individual awards. Fantilli will get closer to that level. He'll always be held back a little bit in the award-winning territory because, of, you know, the guy going to Chicago. Uh, but, yep. like, certainly the gap is relatively small. I don't think taking Carlson would be a terrible move by any stretch of the imagination. But for me, the gap, it, it's decisive but small, you know? Like, it's clear mm -hmm. enough that you have to pick Fantilli. But if you go the other way because of some sort of, say, inside information you have, or maybe there was a better fit somewhere along the line, personality-wise, character-wise, whatever, then I, I guess it's justifiable. But yeah, I'm pretty clearly Fantilli all the way, especially because, you know, you're getting a guaranteed center versus a guy who you are hoping to move back from wing to center, even though we did just see him at the World Championships, but still a little bit more right. positional certainty. And let me just go off of that, kind of with him being a positional center, that's basically where he's going to end up at. Where would you slot him in, just kind of now projecting ahead, in this Ducks lineup, assuming that they, that Zegris, I mean, Zegris can switch to the wing, but with McTavish and everyone there, does he de facto, you think, swap in? I mean, eventually he probably will, I mean, not probably, he will be the first uh, first line center. But where would you think he would slot in next season? Because, I mean, I, I think you would agree with this, that he probably jumps to the NHL next year. Yeah, so he could, he could be 2C or 3C. I think McTavish is actually a good candidate to move to wing, especially because we saw a lot of playmaking growth from him this season. Mm -hmm. As a guy who can sort of like open players up along the boards, get to the inside. Fantilli can do that too, but McTavish will have that extra year of experience to be able to step in. I think they're a good fit as sort of a second line combination right now. So yeah, there. And if worst case scenario, maybe Fantilli doesn't catch on quite as quick in the NHL. You put him at the 3C, you let him have some fun. It'll be fine. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you just made there about McTavish to the wing because that's been kind of the conundrum, and this is like not really a conundrum, <laughs> but this this whole idea that hey, the Ducks are going to draft another center. You've already got Zegris and McTavish. What do you do? Oh my gosh, this is such a problem. Even though last I checked, having a lot of great centers is not a problem. But mm -hmm. what do I know? I'm just a guy with the podcast. But in regards to 
what you were just saying there, most people have Zegris moving to the wing. Why do you think it's McTavish and not Zegris that, that go to the wing? So uh, there, are, there are two primary reasons. The first one is that positions in NHL hockey these days, especially up front, matter less and less. Uh, but for a more traditional system, uh, Zegris isn't, a type, isn't the type of player who thrives along the boards. He can. He certainly has the handling skill, but there are games where he can get pushed out of the pushed out a little bit along the boards. It's not because he doesn't have any bite. It's more because he's kind of a handler in tight guy, pull away from you, deke through you, pass off the boards. He can't really absorb contact and roll with the punches, so to speak, as well as other guys. I want Zegers building speed in the middle of the rink, getting the puck, kicking it out to his wingers, getting it back, deking someone, going to the net. And he won't get as many of those opportunities if he's starting with the puck in the defensive zone along the boards or at the point. Yeah, I think that that's a really good summary yeah. there. And, and I would tend to agree. I think both players are better down the middle. And I'm not saying that, that you think, you know, Fit McTavish is better at the wing. But I do I do like the point that he's probably going to succeed a little bit more on the wing. Whereas Zegers, I mean, we've seen him on the wing quite a bit, unfortunately. Yeah, it and, just doesn't work out as well. And it's just exactly it's just, like you said. And it's and it's interesting because Dallas Akins, who is no longer the Ducks head coach, would, would say that when they would shift Zegers to the wing, that this is going to free him up that this is going to make him be able to, you know, forget all those defensive responsibilities and instead uh, really focus on his offense. And I, I actually think it's the opposite because when you're a winger, you're more folk, you're, you're stuck along the wall. You're going to have to come off the wall a lot more. And like you said, Zegers just isn't, he's not really that type of player. Like he's a guy who just thrives in the open ice. And I think McTavish is better in the open ice, but he's probably a, a bit of a better fit on the, on the wing as well. So. Yeah. And of course the other side of it too, is like, I think, Akins' comment is a little a little crazy because if you're putting, you know, if you're a winger, you're always going back and forth. You're switching your body orientation constantly. You're going down from tracking the play to then suddenly having to go back up to cut off the top. And so there is a ton of defensive responsibility there. As a center, especially as a center, a lot of your job is simply being in the right position to then get the puck and to move it to the next guy. And it is a relatively simpler job to play. Uh, to to some level, depending on the skill, of course, like it all depends mm -hmm. on the skill, but like, yeah, it's just one of these things where like in today's NHL, where there's so many demands for every single forward at all times, like it's not like it used to be like 15 years ago when your winger would just skate up and down the boards in the defensive zone and not yeah. leave that spot of the ice. So yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a weird quote, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, he's no longer the coach. So <laughs> make of that what you will. I yeah. mean, I, I, I this is I work in I, I work in hockey full time, but I, I don't make any real decisions. Yeah. So I, yeah. you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're you're, so, not, you're not casting any blame there. Let me ask you this though on on Fantilli because we've discussed kind of his point totals that that's kind of the surface level stuff that we've seen and then we try our best to to get some other information. But you've done a great job of scouting him, the scouting reports and the Elite Prospects Draft Guide, which. I don't know, Felix, if you've mentioned it yet. Everyone should go check it out. Go check out EliteProspects.com. Go check out the draft guide. It's the most comprehensive thing that you're going to find for um, draft coverage, and there's so much great information in there. But what would you say kind of are the, the biggest talents that, that Adam Fantilli has and maybe a couple of drawbacks, just to give people a little bit more of an in-depth information that they won't uh, find from just more or less us talking about him that you have that kind of more in-depth knowledge on? So Fantilli, high skill center, plays with a ton of pace, very aggressive, like just nonstop on every opponent, slamming them mm -hmm. into the board, slashing them, engaging them super early. Uh, very good at getting pucks off the boards too. So something that you're going to see a lot from him when you watch him in Michigan or in Anaheim this mm -hmm. year is he's going to get on guys early, drive them into the corner, steal the puck off them, beat the next guy with a, with a pass or his hands, and then relocate for a return feed. That's kind of the standard Fantilli play in offensive zone play. Off the rush, the Trevor Zegers thing, build speed down low, kick the puck out wide, start giving goes, passing plays, staying inside space. He's one of the best off-the-pass shooters we've seen come through the draft in the last five, six years. I mean, players are just getting more and more mechanically sound at younger ages, but Fantilli stands out because there isn't a pass that he can't immediately fire on net. It can be behind him. It's a catch-and-release wrister he can even add deception to those plays. So like he will get the puck and then quick handle, pull it in front of him, narrow release, fling it on net super powerfully, really deceptive in those positions. Of course, the handling skill, how he combines deception and pace. You know, it's not just mm -hmm. that he's slowing down and drawing pressure. It's that he's engaging defenders, making them move their stick in one direction and then going through them 
or just like running over them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways that he can beat you. You add in the playmaking, which I think has consistently improved since his time in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's it's not just that he connects with open teammates. It's that he manipulates multiple defenders at a time to then create a passing lane. Does all of, do all of these plays work? Of course not. He's still learning. I mean, it's not. This wasn't the core of his game coming up, playmaking and deceiving. This is something that he added later. Um, and so there are still some inefficiency concerns. That's kind of where the primary, it's all just inefficiency. You know, you lose out on like, uh, I don't know, 5% of the plays, 5% of the value that you could otherwise because he mm -hmm. just passes at the wrong time. The puck leaves a stick a little too early, a little too late. And then there's always the question of like skating. I don't think it's going to be much of a problem. He generates a ton of power. But maybe if he doesn't have quite the same speed advantage in the NHL, he might have slightly longer translating. But we've already seen him deceive, so he'll be able to overcome that and do that in the NHL. Like, I'm talking to the Ducks community here. They know what yeah. guy who is relatively slow and super deceptive can do already. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he just yeah. has so many ways that he can influence a game, so much adaptability. That's really I, I, the core of Adam Fantilli. I guess you mentioned it. How would you compare him to a Ryan Getzloff? Because I, I think that's just an easy comparison to make. This is a person that just retired and we're mm -hmm. transitioning out of that era. And the fact that Fantilli is a power forward and that's kind of how he's being, being, being billed the number one power forward uh, in this draft. How would you compare him to a Getzloff? So De Fantilli definitely faster right away. You mm -hmm. see his game is more built around speed than Getzlaff yep. is. It's more built around shooting than Getzlaff is. He does not have the same level of playmaking. And there's mm -hmm. a chance that he never does. But yeah. I mean, he doesn't need to. He can still be a 100-point guy. Yeah. Like, the reality yeah. of it is when you have this many tools, that many ways to mm -hmm. burn guys, you have clear top five center in the NHL upside. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because hearing you talking about his skating, you know, for example, with Leo Carlson, we hear almost endlessly about his skating and the concerns there. But with Fantilli, you don't hear as much about it. How would you... How would you rate his skating? I know that's like a very broad question. It's yeah. not just straight line speed, but it seems like almost it's less about his, his skating efficiency and more about just his motor. It seems like he just has a really high motor. And also if you could touch on people talk about, he has some snarl to his game. I'm not really sure what entirely that means, but if you could maybe shed light on, on how snarly he is, that would be great. Okay, I, those two go hand in hand perfectly. So they build one into the other. So the first thing is, yeah, he's not the most technically proficient skater, but he can use all of his edges well. He can skate backwards well. He's very powerful. It's all about the power that he generates. And as he gets older and stronger, he's going to maintain a deeper stance for longer, be able to absorb contact even better. And then that's going to make him faster, stronger, sturdier, and so on. And that leads directly into the snarl side of his game, which is <laughs> as he gets more confident or as he gets, as he improves his skating, as he's able to bounce off checks a little bit better, or, I mean, he might just do it in the NHL right away. Like there's no problem. You know, sometimes these things can be deceiving. Uh, yeah. He's got a ton of pushback to his game. You try to run him over. He throws a reverse hit. You try to talk to him. He slashes you. You go into the corner with him. He slams you into the boards, and then he tries to deke through your lifeless body in the corner. Uh, there's a lot of aggression <laughs> to his game. And it's just like, I think, too, a lot of it is that he doesn't do it all the time, but you can tell that he wants to do it, right? Like, this is a player yeah. who, in some capacity is trying to be a more skilled player than a more violent player. Oftentimes it's the other way around, right? When you hear mm -hmm. conversations, some of the top guys in this draft is, oh, you know, they need to be more aggressive. And with Fantilli, I think oftentimes what he's doing is the opposite. And that's, I mean, in the NHL, I mean, we, I know Flora's going to lose or <laughs> likely lose, yeah. but there's a ton of value to having players like that because it's not just about grinding the opposition down, but it's a very valuable way to create offense being able to disrupt opponents, being able to get inside on them, being able to put them on your back and drive the middle is how you score goals in the NHL. And that's, again, the core of Fantilli's game. I mean, I, I've said that twice already, but it's really just there are so many ways he can do things. Yeah. Like you say, oh, can he do this thing? Yes, he can. And he can do it better than 95% of NHL players. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a great point is this whole inside-driven game because watching the playoffs – you know, the watching, even like, for example, watching the last Florida Vegas game, you can see the, the difference between these teams is that Vegas is able to get to the middle. 
whether it's because of their tactics, their skills, or their size, or a combination of, of all those things. And Florida is just unable. And for better or for worse, you still need guys who are able to win battles along the wall, in front of the net, who are able to get to the inside and then allow everyone else to thrive. So it's 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 an important skill as much as I think the game is maybe going in a more skilled, you know, guys, smaller guys have more opportunities. I did want to ask you, though, about his shot, because I think we hear a lot about that. And for me, at least watching him play or watching him shoot, I should say, there's not like necessarily a signature shot there to me. It's more of like a variety of shots of, of different scenarios that he can get it, get it off in and, and, and be dangerous. How would you kind of explain his shot and his mechanics there? And just, does he have, let's say a signature shot? Like, you know, for example, Bedard has that curl and drag. How do you, how do you rate that? His signature, his signature shot. Wow. This is alliteration <laughs> killing me. Here. Uh, his Sorry. signature shot is uh, the off the, off the pass wrister. So okay. when he receives a pass, his top hand is in the place that he needs to shoot it. His top hand is always in front of his body. His bottom hand never goes out in front of it. It's just he receives it instantaneously, loads a stick, puck arrives, shoots it off the pass immediately. Then from there, he can adapt. He can throw in a quick stick handle. He can throw and drag it. He can go backhand, forehand, then shoot it like pump fake, kind of, you know, the change the angle that you see on breakaways a lot. He can do that under pressure. So... Yeah, that's a signature shot. It's also just very powerful. He's good at masking his shot behind different things, even in open ice. Uh, he can play off the threat of his pass to do it. Uh, he's going to be a guy who will beat goalies from distance, but he's not going to take a ton of those shots, I don't think. I think he's going to be more of a pass, relocate, get it back in front of the net, fire away, You know, maybe hack the goalie in there a little bit, and whack <laughs> away, clear up some garbage. That's kind of more how he's going to finish, but... Yeah, just like the shot might be in terms of pure tools, the best puck skill that he has. If you're looking at passing skill, puck handling and shooting, that might be the the one that is highest relative to his peers. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. And then, you know, one thing, one thing else that I want to touch on there with Fantilli is that I've heard a lot of people compare him to Nathan McKinnon. And I'm curious where you stand <laughs> on that, because I feel like Nathan McKinnon is just such a unique player that I have a hard time comparing him to anyone, but... Do you see any shades of that? Is that the snarl factor? What? Why are people saying that? It's because of the pacey rushes, the high pace rushes where he kind of like attacks the middle, beats a guy wide, and fires the puck on net. It's it's very similar. Like McKinnon is kind of this interesting, he kind of stands alone in the NHL because he's very simple in what he creates. Most of his offenses beat guys with speed and then fire, or beat guys with speed and then cut back off back on them and find the trail. That's kind of his game. Fantilli has a lot of those qualities, but so does the vast majority of prospects. So, I mean, I don't think there's a, a ton of similarities to there, but as we learned when we were doing the draft guide with our shades of player comparisons, it's like, it's all just a perspective thing. If you yeah. tell me that it's like, oh, we're stealing this component or that component, or we're using it under this parameters, then yeah, I can see it. But for me personally, it's not the first one that comes to mind. I think in terms of just like pure finesse, you're kind of looking at more of a tage thompson type guy you know he can instantly pull the puck get to the middle you can shoot it off the pass open ice deception and then he's got a bit of a, a bit of an edge to his game you know maybe someone like crosby or malkin someone like that but nothing you know it's always weird talking about comparisons i it's hate tough. this part of the job. <laughs> it's very difficult yeah. it's it's but so people hard love comparisons this is like, for oh, some it's people the, it's the best part so it's the easiest way to make a, a or figure out kind of where they're going to be or try to at least figure out in your head what, what type of player they are but really quick question for you because we've kind of gone on and on about fantilly and there's definitely some people that we see kind of maybe trying to say well what about carlson i think there's some discussion about him maybe going to a, a second overall if that ends up happening why do you think a team would have would go for leo carlson over adam fantilly uh they like swedish people more than canadians <laughs> No, I think you get with with Carlson, you probably get a little bit. He's probably a little bit smarter of a player, a little okay. bit more natural uh, in terms of like the playmaking side. And so maybe if you think Fantilli relies too much on physical advantages that he's going to lose a little bit off of and Carlson is that much smarter and you can justify the pick. I think Carlson's kind of an interesting one because in in a vacuum, he kind of does largely the same thing. Break ankles, get the puck off the boards. Uh, pull off some crazy stuff in open ice, some fancy stuff. He's got the puck protection down. Uh, it's just there's a little bit more risk in his projection because he's not the same level of skater as Fantilli, as we've talked about. A big part of 
puck protection, physicality, is being able to skate, be able to get low and maintain that stance under pressure. That's where you're most balanced, most powerful. You can transition into your crossovers, stops, whatever way easier. And Carlson isn't that level of skater. Does that mean he can't get there? No, of course not. But it's just, yeah, it's just you're getting a little bit lower pace guy. Uh, and that might mean the upside or at least the certainty of hitting that top and upside is a bit lower, at least, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that because, if yep. you, you know, I hate to just be like, hey, look at the eye test. But when you watch Leo Carlson skate, it just it doesn't look like a finished product quite yet. Like he's just so upright and I think his stick is too long. Like this is just my random quirky <laughs> observation, but I think he's going to need to cut it down because it just looks so awkward. I mean, he's still so effective, but there's just there's some refinement there. And I think that I guess well, we'll, we'll get into the bigger kind of theoretical stuff later. Um. I have one last question about the top end of this draft. How many guys do you think could go first overall in just your, your average draft in the, in uh, this draft? So, and, and you, you can include Bedard in there just for simplicity. Five. So Bedard, uh, Fantilli, Carlson, Michkov, and Zach Benson. I think wow. Benson is a, uh, well, he's a better prospect than Shane Wright was. He's a better prospect than Uri Slavkovsky was. He's a better prospect than Owen Power was. And so, yeah, I think Benson is it belongs in that first overall discussion as well. Uh, so, yeah, five guys. Okay. Man, it's it's a great draft. I, yeah. I don't want this to ever end, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it's interesting because with Zach Benson, I've seen you know him mocked at you know late teens, and then I hear you say that, and I'm just I'm wondering where. I understand he's smaller. I understand he's not that fast. But what's why is there such a wide chasm in in the perception of him? Uh, it just comes down to being scared of size and not elite skater combination. I think we also have to acknowledge that he was really small coming into the WHL, getting to, I think he weighed in 168 or something like that at the combine, 165 or something. Getting to that stage has been a challenge for him. And his skating shows that. Like, he's not a refined forward skater. He's one of the best backward skaters, though, in the draft. <laughs> like, wow. legitimately, he's better than many defensemen at backward skating. And so <laughs> backward skating is oftentimes more of like, uh, about balance, finesse, body control, then it is about like raw power. And so it's easy to see that as he gets stronger, he can learn to translate those skills into a sort of forward skating. And then the other part of it too is that like for some people, simply just being smart or being like a hockey genius might not be enough to earn you a top line role in the NHL. And it's like, I, I hear what they're saying, but it's also like this dude is a better playmaker than pretty much anyone that we've seen. I had a tweet the other day where I was talking about Benson's passing statistics, mm -hmm. where he's the best passer mm -hmm. that I've tracked since McDavid. And it's like oh. that McDavid was in the junior hockey a long time ago. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I was in first year of university. I don't even remember what that was like. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's very interesting to hear the it's interesting to hear the discourse around him. Like I understand it, I just don't agree at all, especially with the way the game is going. I'm not saying that you need to pick Andrew Kristall top five or anything like that, but like mm. if you have a guy who is a has a ton of physical room to grow, he's an insane playmaker, he's a great puck getter, he's physical, he's aggressive, he's confident, he can beat you in a million different ways, plays with a ton of pace. That sounds like a first overall caliber talent to me. Yeah. So. I was just going to quickly add that yeah. I think the best retort I've heard to the skating concerns is, well, how, if he's such a bad skater, then how was he getting into all these battles? How was he winning all these battles? How was he always first on pucks? Like you can only be so poor of a skater to be able to accomplish all those things. So anyway, so you mentioned, uh, Connor McDavid. So figured I'd ask this question because I remember this is something that kind of Felix and I talked a little bit about right when, right after the draft lottery, what but we talk about? I don't know. You'll, you'll find out when I ask the question um, okay. with uh, with Adam Fantilli. So if we look back at like the last 10 drafts, how many of them do you think he would have gone first overall? in? OK, so definitely all the way up until the Jack Hughes last three drafts, yep. he's going first overall without mm -hmm. hesitation. The Jack Hughes one, you can make an argument because, again, he's bigger. I mean, I'm just people mm -hmm. I know the same people who are going to be like, oh, Benson isn't a top five pick are also going to be like, well, Jack Hughes was clearly better than Adam Fantilli. And it's like you can't have both of those arguments. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and, and, and also Fantilli, NCAA scoring a ton yeah. in a worse environment. I mean, not a worse environment. Michigan is the best environment a player could possibly be in, but certainly lower quality teammates relative to the opposition that he's facing. He's a better prospect than Svechnikov. You could argue Darlene, too. 
So, and then the Nico Heischer one, yeah, not even close. He's a way better prospect than mm-hmm. Heischer and, and, and Patrick ever were. So Austin Matthews, definitely not. So yeah, the majority of drafts going back to 2015, he would have been the first overall pick unequivocally. The only okay. one that gives me hesitation would be the Darlene and Jack Hughes. Okay. Okay. That seems pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, did we have anything else, Jake, on the top end or should we, should we dive into the... No, uh, that's it for the top end of the draft. I also don't know if we have to do an ad today or not. We do. This is a good time to ask, probably. We do. Do you want me to just do it now and get it out of the way? Uh, Yeah, sure. All right. So this episode is brought to you by 714 Tickets. So I think it's agreed that there's no better way to go watch hockey or, at this time, baseball than going to the games live and in person. That's where 714 Tickets comes in. 714 Tickets is a locally owned ticket company in Anaheim that never charges you taxes or fees, unlike StubHub or Ticketmaster. They're located right in front of Honda Center, but also have a website, 714tickets.com, where you earn 5% back in rewards on every online purchase. So, to recap, you get your to see your favorite team play, pay no fees, and earn rewards back for future purchases. Sounds like a no-brainer to me. So you can shop for your Ducks tickets once the season picks back up in October or your Angels tickets over this summer at sub14tickets.com or stop by their office for a more personal feel. Check them out and use the promo code uh, CTP to get 10% off your purchase. Okay, go check them out. Now, let's talk about the kind of next part of the draft for the Ducks. So I think most people that listen to our show are at this point are pretty familiar with the the, the top end of the draft because we've been talking about it for the longest. But it seems like where would you put the line of, of demarcation in this draft where after that point, there's just it's it becomes harder and harder to parse guys out. Like, is it after 20? Is it after 25? Because it, it really seems to me like, I don't know, after even 15, it seems like it gets really, really hard to, to kind of rank these guys. I would say if we're going by 2023 Elite Prospects Draft Guide, which you should go to eprankside.com and subscribe, you can get it for a one monthly payment of $12.99 US, or you can or you can subscribe annually and get 50% off. Anyway, so go so if we're going by the Elite Prospects Draft Guide, you would start at say 12 to the end of the first, even early second, is a pretty similar tier. You could argue Lukas Dragasevic in the top 15 if you're if you don't care for skating issues, you could argue that Musty is a late first if you're concerned about more other things that people are concerned about with Quentin Musty for some reason. Anyway, so, <laughs> and then, but more broadly, I would say it's probably from like 20 and on, it just becomes a total mess. The, the appeal of this draft is really the insane top end and the fact that there are about 60 guys who could be late first, early seconds, maybe 70. Mm-hmm. Ooh, 70 wow. yeah 70 that's, probably that's, that's a big range so you're saying this could be a good draft to have three second round picks in. i mean it might be the best draft ever to have that many second round picks in. <laughs> <laughs> there you go well so let's just throw these these picks at you then so at number 33 ducks have three second round picks 33 59 and 60 so at 33 let me put it this way who do you think who who do you think would be realistically available that would make the most sense to you? And then just purely by your own rankings, who do you think is someone that they should target in that range? So I think first we should talk about what do the Ducks draft? And thankfully, the Ducks make this incredibly easy. I look at their draft record and it's like, man, they like tall, toolsy, activating defensemen. And uh, up front, they like kind of hard skill guys who have handling skill and like to attack the middle, maybe a, maybe tall, but a little bit physically immature. And so the guy who comes to mind right away is Callan Lind out of Red Deer. Mm-hmm. He's 150 pounds of pure hate and violence. <laughs> uh, the most comically aggressive player you'll ever see. He gets the worst of every single exchange, but that doesn't stop him from trying. Very <laughs> skilled player, too. Um, like, he sees his teammates getting open or trying to get open, but Red Deer isn't very good at that, which we might, if we talk about Ben King, we can expand on that further. But the... Uh, He's not in a good situation to use his skills, and he was playing like 13 minutes a night, and he was still a point per game, and he's insanely aggressive, very physical. The Ducks have a track record of helping guys who are a little bit less physically mature grow into their body and show off their skills. See Connor Vitzton this season, who was like 165 pounds at six foot three, He's added a bit of weight, and he was one of the better players in the WHL last season. So 
he stands out. We had him ranked at 44, but like you can make a top 20 argument for him just because of the work rate, the flashes of skill, the vision, and just pure anger. Um, <laughs> uh, Danny Nelson, uh, uh, Danny Nelson also lands in that tier. David Edstrom as well, kind of these big toolsy guys who have flashes of open ice playmaking, but right now their game is more of like attacking the middle. Those two guys are completely fine as the first pick of the second. Also, wonder though if the Ducks might go, say, like really high skill for, like maybe Bradley the Doe gets there, who might have the second best shot in the draft. Maybe Nick Lardis is still kicking around as the sort of high pace shooter who can really break down defenders on speed alone. And then the defensive side, if Dragasevic gets there, he seems like a classic duck target, tall guy who's just like insanely creative, was the hub of his team offensively, great at manipulating opponents, activating off the point. Sounds familiar, I know. Maybe Caden Price is one of the later seconds. Carter Southern, a tall dude who can really skate, love, loves to join the play. Uh, kind of like a Tyson Hines, very similar to him uh, with a little bit more skill. Uh, Matt Mania, Gavin McCarthy is just like pure geek everything, hit everything defenseman who the Ducks <laughs> have certainly not shied away from before. So there's a lot of players in this range who really fit, and they might be the Cohen Zemer team too. I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that they do. Cohen Zemer is, in terms of pure puck skills, a top 15 player in this draft. He can really rip it. He can manipulate defenders to create passing lanes. He's got great hands. He's very violent, physical, loves to get in players' faces. He just can't really skate at all. Like it's pretty, it's pretty rough looking. Maybe he can do the Ryan O'Reilly thing where he just outworks everyone despite being like super upright through his lower half and then really hunched over. But yeah, I wonder if they might be the team that takes him. So yeah, lots of good options in there. Yeah, I was thinking that, you know, the Ducks have been so focused on picking up blue liners the last few years that I'm looking and, you know, well, Jake, do you want to transition into the Ducks prospect pool? Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's a good so, chance to do that. Let me know what you think about this. How do, how would you rate the Ducks' current forward crop for their prospect pool? I'm assuming that you're not counting McTavish and Zegris, because I think we're kind of reaching a point here where the Ducks are clearly very set on the back end, but now up front is not looking quite as quite as bright. How do you how do you view their forward crop? It's weak. You would like to see another maybe two potential play drivers in there. I think Vidston. Gaucher, Patch, Jov are probably their three best forward prospects right now, unless I'm forgetting someone. I mean, I guess there's Perot, but the AHL hasn't really worked out for him. L, the <laughs> AHL guys kind of hit a rut, I guess. Yeah. And so I, I might be forgetting someone in there, but like those, those are, anyway, that's kind of where they're at. And all those guys are more sort of at best mid six scoring guys who don't bring a ton of value outside or their third, fourth liners who bring well-rounded three-zone play like Vidston. Yeah. So I, I, they I, need I, to add some talent there, for sure. Y- yeah. yeah. I, watching Gaucher play like in the Memorial Cup, he's. I think he's clearly a guy that's that's going to play. I think that's why yeah. they drafted him. But it does feel like there's just not that much more meat on the bone offensively. I don't know how you, how you view his offensive ceiling, but it doesn't feel like there's a ton, there's a ton there left to, to really add to his game. It would have been nice if he added more playmaking this season, I think. If he he does flash in an open ice, but if he had just like a little bit more, it would make the sort of complementary mid-six winger projection pretty much set in stone. But since mm-hmm. it's not all the way there yet, he's still kind of this uncertain guy who maybe he gets to the AHL and the pace of the game just kind of becomes more problematic and hot, and he ends up losing some of the skills that he showed over the last couple of seasons. So yeah, it's... it's He's, he's kind of one of those weird players that might kind of get caught in between unless he really leans into the hard skill mm-hmm. side more. Yeah. Jake, were you yeah. something? Yeah, I wanted to just ju- kind of jump in and kind of ask you this question. I uh, kind of talking about kind of one of the, the downsides of the stuck system with the forward group, but they will be adding Adam Fantilli to that. But with them adding, if they, well, if they draft him, but assuming they do, where would you rank this Ducks prospect group in terms of around the league? Having looked at kind of what you had last year, you had the Ducks ranked third. Mace McTavish now will have graduated from that, but now they'll be adding, adding Adam Fantilli. Kind of just kind of wanting to follow up upon where you think this uh, prospect group would end up at with that in uh, uh, around the NHL. I still have thousands of games to watch before I can thoroughly answer that question, ah, but I would say... I figured probably, as much. I would say probably top five. You're, you're getting... Okay. 
you're getting an upgrade on McTavish, and all of your defensemen took gigantic steps. Like, yeah. Minchikov became yep. god. Zellweger was already god. And, like, you have Tyson Hines, who looks like the part looks like a real NHL prospect. Mm-hmm. Moore looks like a real NHL prospect. And Jackson Lacombe took a really big step this season, especially in the second half. So, uh, like, those, those are all potential top 100 caliber prospects. You add Fantilli into that. Mm-hmm. Maybe Pasha Job can sneak in there at the end or Natan Gauthier. So, um, yeah, I would say top five, especially if they're able to add some skill with that first second rounder, then, yeah, top five seems likely. And I guess to follow up on that, kind of who do you see as the last year, kind of the biggest risers and the biggest fallers within the duck system? Okay, so pure, this is this is not including the AHL because I have not watched their AHL team. So Com- Leno, completely fine. Leno, obviously, big riser for a lot yep. of different reasons. Um, Vidston, big, big riser here. I, this is a player who ha- who showed individual components, but this season he kept the strong defense, added some playmaking, became more deceptive, became a better skater. He looks like a real candidate to play in a bottom six role. Um Pachijov has shown a bit more nuance to his game this season, especially with Sarnia. I don't know mm-hmm. if he's a big riser, but certainly a guy who I think is trending up. And then Minchikov and Zellweger have raised their ceilings and their floors for sure, just by the added defense of yeah. Minchikov and Zellweger becoming a better playmaker this season, despite shooting the puck more. I, that's, as I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's <laughs> with Zellweger, it, you just can't insane. predict these things. Yeah, it I just feel, gets I, more and more ridiculous. I feel like it was ho hum, another eleven shot game for him. Like what? What? Yeah, and then is, it, is that and real? It's like he set up eight shots too, and you're like, wait a second, he took eleven shots and set up eight more. How how does the defenseman do that? Do you <laughs> think he's NHL ready? I guess because you probably have seen him more than most people have. Do you think he's NHL ready to make that jump next season? I mean, purely for selfish reasons, I would love to see him in the AHL just to see what happens. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, he's NHL ready. He's, he's okay. an incredible rush defender. He's a great in zone defender. The breakouts have improved. He's become a better playmaker. The decision making is really strong. He's very decisive, very aggressive, never, sh- never short on confidence. You know, he's one of those players who there will be changes in his game when he gets to the NHL. Mm hmm. But he'll make them instantly because it's Olin Zellweger. That's just what he does. He always finds a way to make an impact. So, yeah, he's NHL ready. Minchikov is NHL ready. Okay. We'll see exactly where the skating ends up at the professional level. But, yeah, both of them can play in the NHL next year. Yeah. I have a little doubt about that. That was going to be my follow-up because I know Minchikov is AHL eligible next year. So if there's something for him to gain in the AHL or he's he's ready to jump to the NHL right away. I would, I would really like to see him, like uh, – maybe get a little bit of time. Maybe the preseason is, is mm-hmm. all he needs, right? Just to see kind of like what he looks like in the pro game. But with the 67s, they play, uh, they lose the Saginaw creativity and gain a mm-hmm. little bit more uh, traditional structure and positions and so on. And I thought, I thought Minchikov really thrived there. Like it was a glimpse into what he'll look like at the professional mm-hmm. level. So you see fewer deeks and more passing plays, give and goes more kind of like creeping down the weak side, getting open for one timers or, I mean, it's Minchikov. So it's like creeping down the weak side to then make the other play back across the slot for a scoring <laughs> chance. Like as if he's on the power play, but like, and then the defense really improved too. I mean, yeah. he always had great play killing instincts, but now he's refined that with better defensive skating, better positioning, mm-hmm. more aggression. So yeah, both of them can play next year. Yeah, what, what did you make of the Ducks sending him back to junior last year? Because we saw him just briefly in training camp and preseason games, and he looked fantastic. Um, wasn't getting 11 shots on goal per game, but do you think that it was the right call? Do you think that he really benefited from that that extra year in junior? You mean Zellweger, Zellweger, right? right? Zellweger, yeah, yeah. So not Michukov. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Zellweger needed this for sure. I think if they were to put him in the NHL right away, there's a chance that maybe you don't, get the same level of rush defense and playmaking that he developed this season. And so it's one of those things that maybe uh, it elevated his upside from number two, number three to potential to clear cut top pairing, potentially number one defenseman caliber, because now he's got everything. So, I mean, I guess he's only five foot 10, but like, you know, yeah. That, that's, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the conversation kind of Felix and I are going to have a bunch this summer, but kind of, with the fact that they have Jackson Lacombe, who I think, from what we saw at the end of the season, looks NHL ready. Looks ready. Yeah. Minchikov, Zellweger. I think Hellison looked pretty close to that also from what we saw at the end of the season. I mean, do you think they should just run out those guys next season and have Fowler and Drysdale also? Or do you think there's probably a need 
also to add well, maybe one more defenseman there to help out. You add one more and keep Minty and and Lacombe and Hellison on a rotation, I think. Okay. Um, I think Minchikov probably is the guy who ends up getting the most games. Lacombe's a little bit more of a specialist. Full credit to him is in his own defense improved, the rush defense improved, yeah. but he's going to be fighting to get power play time, and that's really what he needs. Yeah. And I don't know if his future is with the Ducks long term in the NHL. Hmm. Makes sense. And, and then Hellison is like kind of a he's a very toolsy player, very aggressive, gets the better of him sometimes. And I think in the right situation, the Ducks can leverage that into sort of this low minutes, but not necessarily play driving, but can keep the play out of his own zone defenseman. Yeah, it's interesting you say that Lacombe's future might not be with the Ducks because we just saw Henry Thrun go over to San Jose. How do you think that was any bit of a loss for the Ducks that that he dropped out of their system or it's just kind of a wash because of all the skill they have? Yeah, it was an inevitability. It was going to be one of them, right? I think mm-hmm. you, they, I, these they're university students. They look at this and they're like, huh, this doesn't add up. <laughs> How dare they? How dare they? Where's the loyalty? Yeah, Thrun's got a Harvard degree. He's like, hmm, <laughs> this doesn't look too good this, for me. There's a lot of great defense on this team. Maybe I won't get the ice time I'll get in San Jose, who has almost no one. Um, yeah. yeah, he yeah. goes on Twitter and he just sees Zellweger highlights and he's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> there no, goes good. my ice time. He sees He'll be in the contract. NHL. Yeah. Thrun will be good. He'll be in the NHL. Smart player. He can defend the rush. Physical likes to step up on guys. I think Ian Moore, personally, is a better prospect than him. Um Thrun also might not necessarily fit what the Ducks kind of value these days with the more toolsy, mobile, hyper-aggressive players, and he's not that. He's more methodical uh, approach. I think he's a good NHL player, but not necessarily what they've... You know, he stands out in the Ducks system as being a little atypical for what they have. Yeah, I would say on the tools side, he was probably the least exciting. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think here who else we can touch on in the in the duck system we were going to ask you about jacob perot but you were saying you you somehow didn't watch every single ahl game this year so i, I guess yeah what's that. happening to him what do you guys think of him this is this well is it's, it's, it's interesting because reading uh the scouting reports on, on his brother i actually get a lot of jacob perot in in those reports because there's a lot of skill there's a good shot but the, the actual physical tools aren't quite there to leverage those skills. And the Ducks AHL system felt like such a mess this year. It and, was a bit of a it was a bit of a banana republic. And it feels like sure. Paverbeek has kind of been trying to rework the entire system, bring in his own development guys. Now having Matt McIlvain there to kind of preach the system that he wants to play, and I think Greg Cronin's going to have a similar system in the NHL. And so it seems like that's been a big piece of what he's looking at, and. It's hard to say exactly what happened with Pro because we haven't watched too many of the, the goals games overall, but it feels like from the development aspect, a lot of guys suffered over the last year or two. Yeah. Well, you, you look at their coaching. They had Joel Bouchard for, was it a year or two years? And he it's was all a blur. He was a Bob Murray guy, which I think is is a telling, a telling headline. And then you have... Uh, was it Roy Sommer who was in yep. his last year as a, as a coach, I believe. So probably not the most fertile ground for, for player development when you have uh, a tyrant and Bouchard and uh, a guy who's just kind of one foot out the door and, and Sommer. I did actually want to ask you about this here, Mitch, you know, AHL versus junior. Cause I, I think a few years ago I was more of the opinion of, Hey guys need to play pro hockey. This is how they're going to learn. This is how they're going to adapt. And as time has gone on, I've kind of swung back the other way. You know, what do you think is the optimal development path for for prospects? I'm sure there's not a one size fits all answer, but maybe specifically just the AHL versus junior path. Okay, so I'll, I'll preface it with this: No, your favorite prospect who was picked in the late first round or the fourth <laughs> for some reason is not too good for junior hockey. Zell Wagner <laughs> won WHL Defenseman of the Year. What should have won CHL Defenseman of the Year last year? went back and improved, and he's better for it. I think the vast majority of players can go back, and if they're willing and if they're surrounded by a good team with a good supporting staff, with good development, and they have a good ear to their NHL team, they will find new ways to improve, new ways to adapt, and it'll benefit them. I also think that the AHL has become... um, not criticizing anyone's anyone in particular, but like the AHL has become a league where coaches are scared to take risks. 
And in junior, you have teams like Saginaw, where everywhere it's just full positionless hockey and tons of activation. Everyone is encouraged to experiment and create. You got fourth line players manipulating opponents like their first line scorers on another CHL team. So like though those there are more teams like that in junior than in the AHL. And so if you can go back to an opportunity like that, you do that every single time. No matter who you are, unless like you're Adam Fantillion. And you, you know, you're going from NCAA to junior. Don't do that. But like, you know what I mean? Do go to the place where you're going to get the most opportunity to shine offensively. Another year isn't going to hurt any of these guys for the most part, especially now where I think five, 10 years ago, junior hockey was a very different landscape. Now everyone can play in junior hockey. Everyone can skate. Everyone can handle the puck. Everyone can make offensive plays. So it's a lot more competitive. It's a lot tighter. And also production isn't necessarily a sign that players are doing things in NHL translatable ways. Oftentimes it's, they rely on one skill or one play too much that they'll lose entirely at the next level. And if an NHL team is like, Hey, maybe you should not just be taking shots from the top of the circle uh, because you won't score goals like that in the NHL. They will go back and learn how to do that and learn how to do other ways in a pressure free environment compared to the AHL. So yeah, I think junior all the way, the vast majority of the time. So I think I know the answer to this already then, but Nathan Gauthier, AHL or back to the QMJHL next year? I think, well, he's in a different situation because he'll be an overager, right? So uh, yes, he's a late birthday, I think. So uh, yeah. So, I mean, he can go to the AHL. He can step in and be fine. I, yeah. I don't, I think personally, four years is four years. The fifth year isn't going to help most players. The fifth year is kind of a weird one, right? That's where players' tendencies tend to get like exacerbated a little bit and they mm-hmm. lean heavier and heavier. But again, if the Ducks give him a good concrete development program, he'll probably get traded from the Ramparts in that case, go somewhere else, and may, hopefully he lands in a team with a similarly strong structure, then it won't hurt him, that's for sure. Yeah, and I guess one more question about kind of the Duck system for me. Um, so you mentioned Tristan Leno as being one of the big risers. What would you kind of say was the the biggest thing for him that made him go from being, I mean, he was ranked 13th in the prospect pools last year and kind of rising up to where he's uh, ending up at and where he finished the season at this past season. So, I mean, the big one is obviously that Gatineau learned how to score this season. So, <laughs> like... <laughs> that helped. That, that definitely helps. I mean, it, it's good that he has a better supporting cast, but really with him, it's just cranking the dial up to 11. It's kind of mm-hmm. a Zellweger thing. Like, he okay. just understands now that if I do this thing, that means that this player is going to move in that direction, and then I can take advantage of that. And so now he just does that more and more and more and more, and he does it faster and faster and faster and faster, and then he just keeps racking up the points and becomes more of a player driver. That's kind of the core of it here, just going crazy. That's that's what you that's what you want to see, experimentation. Yep. Yeah, which doesn't really happen uh, in the AHL, I would say. Um, okay, Jake, did you have anything else on the prospects? I have a, I have a couple of like more general questions. Nope. And Go for it. We could probably get into questions people have. Yeah, uh, we have some in our Discord that so we'll get Mitch, to. I saw you in in the draft guide re- refer to use the term play building. What is the difference between play building and play making? Uh, okay, so with play making, you're kind of looking at who's putting the finishing touches on a play. So the guy who was passing to then set up the scoring chance. With play building, you're looking deeper in the ring. You get a puck, you pass it out. You know, the Trevor Zegras, what he does on his breakouts, that's play building. A lot of east-west passing, you're still advancing the puck, playing with pace, give and go sort of thing. And in junior, play building players are shockingly hard to find. There are a lot of guys who can sort of do the plays as a reaction, but there are very few players who can do them proactively, who can sort of, you know, draw pressure and then pass the puck and then relocate and then do it again on the next touch as the advance of the rink. And so that's a big thing in today's NHL where everyone is supposed to get a touch in a sequence. Your defensemen are supposed to be making plays. Your forwards are supposed to be making plays. And so play building, you can also look at it as, say, the Trevor Zegerish off the boards rush thing where he kind of drifts wide and he cuts back and finds the trailer. The next pass usually isn't to someone to a scoring chance is often back to his defenseman. And then that sets the zone and lets them set into their ozone play. That's play building. Okay. Yeah. Cause I feel like when I think about play building, I think about Mason McTavish for some reason where I feel like he's just watching him play this season. And I think you had an article about him at some point this season, or you wrote about mm-hmm. 
I feel like he's always making those little plays all over the ice, and that's why he's so good at center, at least. Is that how you kind of view McTavish as well? Yeah, exactly. And the great part about him, right, is you can you can be both. You can be the play builder and you can be the playmaker. And on top of that, he's the play finisher. He's got all three in one, and that's kind of what makes him such a special player. And similarly, Fantilli can do all three of those things, Carlson to a lesser extent. And so it's just another way that players can impact the game and create more opportunities for themselves and their teammates further up the rink. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that that should be very encouraging for, for Ducks fans. And then one final question here. Actually, two more. So I'll start with a more conceptual one, and then I'll put one that's a bit more of a, pr- of a prediction. So you referred to Dmitry Simashev. I think it was in a game report. You said he could end up just being a, a bundle of tools. And <laughs> I thought that was really funny just because, like, just thinking about what that means, what... Why is it that some players, like let's say Simashev, can be can have this bundle of tools, great skaters, great shot, what have you, but it never ends up actually coming together in the NHL? Like how, why does that happen, and and what can you do to avoid that? If let's say you're like a development staff, so there are, there are many different reasons, but I think they roughly follow the same few patterns. So the first one is that they never learn how to do anything tangible in the game. So like. They never learn how to build a play. They never learn how to finish the play. They never learn how to kill a play or they never learn how to play or they never learn how to create a play. And so they don't have any sort of ability to dictate the game in in any capacity. So they have the tools they could, but they never learn it. That's becoming less and less common as teams become, let's say, uh, aware of the money they're sinking into these things and realizing that previously they might as well have just been lighting it on fire. So that's becoming less common. The other one is that they rely on untranslatable patterns. So very toolsy players can get away with doing things at lower levels that they can't do at higher levels. So if Shemeshev wanted, he could just outskate everyone and go end to end every single game. Or he could have at lower levels, right? And then as you advance the ranks, that gets harder and harder and harder to develop. To call it back to Fantilli, that's what Fantilli used to do. If you watch him back before in, in minor hockey, Fantilli was just ripping up and down the ice, being more physical, faster, have better hands than everyone. And he added the nuance to his game later because mm-hmm. you can't do that in the NHL. Otherwise, you become Josh Anderson, who makes an impact <laughs> one in every 30 games. So it's really about, <laughs> yeah, you need to get rid of those patterns. And then on top of that, a lot of it too is that sometimes tools just don't translate in the way that the evaluator, me, might think. Like, There are some times where you're like, this guy looks really fluid. He looks smooth, composed. And then he gets to the NHL and you're like, oh, he's not fast at all. (laughs) Like he just, he just can't move at that level. Sometimes he can't think at that level. Sometimes he can't handle the puck at that level and so on. There are just so many different things. Like you can be, it's very easy to just misevaluate things or just be completely wrong. Like I would argue that scouting is just being wrong and getting away with it. Like, (laughs) <laughs> you call me in as an expert and it's like, man, I'm wrong 95% of the time. Like even when I'm right, it's accidental. Like if I'm like, oh, I think Mason McTavish <laughs> is going to be a great NHL player. There is going to be something there that I didn't get. And that's what made him a great NHL player. Yeah. So you can't, you know, it's everything. really exactly, exactly. Well, yeah. it, I, I'm mildly concerned that Jamie Drysdale is, is a bit of a bundle of tools right now. I don't know if you can talk me off this ledge, but watching him play at least his rookie season, it felt, and this could have, I mean, Brandon Montour is like this when he was with the Ducks, where it seems like his only play is skate end-to-end, enter the zone, and then if there's no options, dump it in or just throw it on net. Like, it just doesn't seem like there's not there's just not a bunch of refinement to those tools right now. I don't know how much Drysdale you've been able to watch over the last couple of years, but have you seen, do you have any concerns or do you think he's right on schedule? He's just passive, right? Like that's the thing. He doesn't <clears throat> he doesn't make a ton of things happen with the puck. He again, like you said, it's very much that he just kind of skates the puck out of trouble, dumps it in, or he just makes a rim to the other side or reversal. There's not really mm-hmm. much of using the middle. There's not much of really using his tools. He's not really building plays or creating favorable situations for his teammates. And so yeah, right now he is kind of a toolsy project. Still the other side of it too is like he could also just be this dynamic play creator that has been hidden by the fact that he's young in the NHL and yeah, being honest, like in a bad environment. Yeah. So yeah. I, mean, I mean, no well, one's fooled that this is, and no we've talked, this is a good environment. <laughs> and we've talked so much about Dallas Aikens, not necessarily being able to utilize co- guys properly. 100%. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. There's and, always and of course, that. 
the the other part of the other part of this too was what was Drysdale and Junior, and you could argue that he had the same issues. So to some degree, you would like to see improvement, but he's also very much learning on the job in an environment where he probably shouldn't have been in. And then yes, in a, in the worst possible situation you could be in in that environment that you shouldn't have been in in the first place. So you know, yeah. cut him some slack, give him a couple more years to kind of see where he's at. But I think in terms of is he a sixth overall pick caliber player or tracking as someone who's going to be a top pairing defenseman at this stage maybe not yeah i think i think that that's fair and, and like you said it's not entirely his fault like the environment the fact that there was a pandemic that shut down his league he had to play the ahl that there's there's so much there mm-hmm. um we could do another podcast on that but um my last question here before we do listener questions uh this this is you know this is for the fans this is this is for people who probably want to think about this Kings versus Ducks over the oh, next right. five years. Who, who is better positioned, do you think, to win the Stanley Cup over the next five years? The the LA Kings or the, the Anaheim Ducks? Hmm. It's not a uh, trick question. Is, is this <laughs> is is this Crash the Pond podcast a Kings podcast by chance? I, I'm unsure of I'm unsure <laughs> of the listener base. Here. Yeah, you know, we've uh, we've really been talking about Alex Turcott here, so I understand uh, the confusion. Also, Felix, full disclosure, put this out on Twitter the other week, and the I, I replies mean, were mean, something. I made my opinion known, and uh, Kings fans did not take well to it. It, it. I was in the Twitter vortex for a few days, just stuck stuck to the algorithm. But my own opinion is that I think the Kings are kind of tethering themselves to, like, they're not letting it play out further with their prospects. And I think that that might be hindering their pro their progress a little bit. Yeah, that's my that that's that to 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 so I don't get killed. Uh, I would say <laughs> yes, that's that is the correct idea. I 100 percent agree. And no, I'm not being pressured into this. But okay, in, in all seriousness, you could disagree. You could disagree. In all seriousness, how many of their prospects have have developed at all? I mean, Cali is the only one that comes to mind. Velarde. Well, Cali, it feels like he's developing in spite of, of the team. That's I was just going to say, there is, like, obviously, I can't <laughs> fair say everything here, but a lot of the Cali thing is just like he woke up one day and is like, you know what? This rules. I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that, that's half of the Cali story, at least. And so I think they've, they've had some real issues with development. They, I guess, Velarde kind of turned it around a little bit. He went on that insane bender early, and he came again. He, came, he got it hot again a bit later, but mm-hmm. Byfield has not really developed. Turcott just don't know what they're going to do there. A lot of these guys, a lot of them, even the guys who looked like they were like top developed players coming out of junior, Akil Thomas, Jordan Spence, they've kind of hit these walls. And I mean, you can even argue Brant Clark. Like I, I, I responded to this in, in, in on Twitter on Twitter a little while ago. But like even Brant Clark, who scored a ton has not fixed any of the problems that plague him. He still struggles on breakouts. He still struggles on retrievals. These are key skills if you want to do these things in the NHL, especially on the LA Kings. Like, this is, they're they're not like reinventing the wheel here. If, if Brant Clark was going to a team where he was going to be allowed to activate up the play off puck, and then he can cook, you know, so he doesn't have to have those bad, more pressured touches that he's not great at then yeah, I would have a lot more confidence in him. But for now, I think Minchikov and Zellweger are better prospects than him. He's still great, don't get me wrong. But I think they've had major issues developing, and they're also probably going to be in cap trouble. So, I mean, they might not be, just because none of them have actually developed. So I would say <laughs> I lean the Ducks. That might be, I think that's kind of the, it's the less obvious angle, but just in terms of how their prospect pools are tracking, it's probably the ducks at this stage, to be honest. And yeah, mm-hmm. it's I, a really I, tough, it's tough looking at this LA team. Like it's, it's, it's more annoying as a prospect guy than anything. The Turcotte thing. Okay. You get a pass on one of these guys on one of them over and over. I yeah. feel too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause I feel like there's this notion out there that the ducks are this team that's on the, you know, the, the cutting room floor of the rebuild and they're still I think there, there was something just put out there that the rebuild just began for this team. And it's like, not really, you know, Trevor Zegers is going to get his second contract this summer. So is Jamie Drysdale. Do you got to pay Troy Terry? Like it's on, like they, they have to, to get going. Um, oh, I had one more question. This is completely unrelated to anything we've talked about so far. Where, where are you out on Alexi Lafreniere? Where did it, 
has it gone wrong is this will you, it ever, just will it ever is get this, better <laughs> is this you just like finding all the things that people disagreed with you on and asking no, Mitch's opinion Well, because i threw it out there that hey maybe alexi lafreniere is a good dart throw for the ducks because they kind of need they just need some upside up front do you think there's still a future for alexi lafreniere as a as a high-end producer or, or has that ship sailed well, just as we said, you don't get you don't get two of these, right? The Rangers they screwed up Kako and screwed up Lafreniere. You don't. This is it, it, one of them is like okay, especially Kako, right? Who's a guy who relies on physicality and and edge work and in tight skill that he hasn't been able to translate to the NHL. And if you're a development coach, and you can't be like, hey, you know that thing, you know your whole game, and. You, you need to do that thing again. How can we help you do that? The fact that no one has been able to figure that out in the Rangers, or they haven't, maybe he just doesn't listen. I don't know. Yeah. But the fact that he hasn't figured that out in the NHL is a huge problem. And the fact that Lafreniere is is having largely the same issues despite translating those high-end skill and hockey sense abilities in flashes in the NHL. Like, he does them. It's just that he doesn't get, A, the opportunity, and B, his margin for error is so much smaller in the NHL because he doesn't have the he doesn't have the skates, the skating, the skates, I'm sure, of his jet speed or whatever he uses. <laughs> he doesn't have the footwork to be able to pull it off consistently. And so there are different ways that Lafreniere can go in the NHL, right? He can lean even heavier on the deceptive, the manipulative, the Trevor Zegras style, you know, where you're just – throwing stuff out there constantly mm-hmm. and trying to see what works and trying to deceive and break some ankles. And that's what you want Lafreniere likely to do. But I'm sure the Rangers are being like, huh, maybe you should just get faster and uh, eat better. And, you know, like, yeah, he, like he, if he goes to a different team, he's going to be great, I think. But the Rangers here, like they've lost all, yeah. all plausible deniability here. They've really messed this up. Do, do you think he would have benefited from going back to, to Ramuski or it's just, something went wrong in, in the pros. Like he, he should have been in so, the pros, but it just went wrong. He should have been in the pros, just not in the Rangers. That's oh. my take. Okay. Fair enough. I think I speak for everyone when I say, man, sure don't like the Rangers and what they're doing these days. <laughs> it's just it's just such a bum. Well, yeah, now Peter Lavia Lavia's oh, gonna yeah. come in and, and fix Alexi Lavia, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but this it, is gonna go great. Oh, it's great. just a shame because he was such a fantastic prospect and it's and, now, feel and like, I just hate the whole bust narrative around him because I feel like it's not his fault. Anyway, it's Felix, all you're getting torch. You're getting torched by our Twitch. Why chat, am I by getting torched? I'm just you're I'm getting asking, torched. I'm asking questions. I'm just I'm just a guy asking questions. You know, you're getting torched. Uh, okay. All right, we're gonna get into some questions though. Um, I think just with the amount of time and Mitch, you've been so uh, gracious with your time. We'll just stick to our Discord questions. Just get a couple in here. Um, but uh, T Bolt uh, asked this question and. I may butcher this name. I don't really know. But why is Grayson Sachin so divisive? I've seen him ranked anywhere between 13 to 116. Obviously, those are outliers, but still, that's a big difference. Also, would he be a good fit for the Ducks? So I personally think, as the person who ranked him 13th, that everyone else is stupid. There it is. They don't know how to scout. And (laughs) you can radio this. Cook on him. (laughs) No, I think think it's because he's 5'10 and 150 pounds, and his game is crashing into people and breaking their ankles. And uh, he plays a game that has has very little room for error at the next level. I think he's a super high-skill, slippery guy, very smart. He can beat you in a ton of ways has the full offensive toolkit in the NHL. And I'm glad that someone asked this question because I was writing his article tonight for Rinkside. It's supposed to come out tomorrow morning, there but there's go. no way I'm getting it done now. But anyway. So <laughs> Sorry think, about that. Yeah, Oops. yeah. Whatever. It's all good. Uh, I, think he's, I think he's a pretty clear top 15 talent in this year's draft, but I do acknowledge there's a lot of risk to his projection because, you know, it just – he doesn't mm-hmm. have the same profile, and there's always the chance that he goes late in the draft, and maybe he doesn't get the same resources put into him as he would if he were a first rounder. So it's, okay. I think it's just a size and skating thing. Okay. Um, Olaf is berserker asks, uh, looking backward, how would you rate? And this is for you, Mitch. Obviously, uh, Pat Verbeek's draft last year. Uh, extremely. Good. I mean, would you want to go down the draft? Like Minchikov, amazing. Yep. Roche still tracking as a decent player, I think. Yep. Noah Warren is still Noah Warren. Toolsy, long, physical. He's pretty intelligent. Lots of little things that you think can go to the NHL. Leno looks like an NHLer. Ben King might have a... I don't know if Ben King plays, but he's a solid bet to score in the AHL. 
Vidston could be a bottom six guy. Callow is kind of Ben King S, but has higher end flashes in the USHL, you know, big deaky guy, but he can actually manipulate opponents and create favorable situations. And the goalie, I have no idea. So I think <laughs> in general, this is probably a solid A draft, okay, especially that, because it fits what the Ducks are trying to do. Was that Budietz? Was that the guy they took late? No, that was two years ago. Oh, okay. The, the no, they goal. took him last year. They took Budietz. Oh, okay. It was, Alex, it was Alexander the year before. Okay. Oh, well. Yeah, so it was Booty. Yeah. I'm on uh, eliteprospects.com right now. Everyone check out <laughs> Boom. Elite Go check I him remember, out. I just remember Booty not having, like, we, we looked him up for our, our podcast, and, like, there were there were no pictures of him on the internet. Like, we couldn't find, like, just a mugshot <laughs> of him. It was crazy. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that, you know, people are aware of him now. Uh, T-Ball <laughs> said, we've heard a lot about uh, the Ducks' highest end prospects, like Zellweger, Minchikov, and Leno. But who are the sleeper Ducks prospects that don't get talked about enough? Oh, Ian Moore. If we're going down this angle, Ian Moore is great. He, yeah. He can beat opponents off the point, but it's really that he's become one of the NCAA's best defensive defensemen. He's He takes the middle. He's very aggressive. He angles attacks wide. He steps into opponents. He lacks a bit of polish, but like you see some real aggressiveness and play killing. And in the right situation, he can really take off. He's not unlike Hellison, but he's even faster. He's even more confident offensively, and he has more skill. So him, and if you want to go deeper, I, I can't believe I've said his name this much, but Connor Vitson is another guy I'd watch yeah. out for. <laughs> yeah. He's a long-term guy, but like he really added some deception to his game this year. Like Really creative. The shot is still good. The defense is the best part of his game, but long-term upside that's exciting i think for for a sort of third fourth line guy like he's going to provide some highlights along the way and could be a potential mm-hmm. positive analytics you know play driving results type player fun that, yeah that's someone where, that i haven't really thought too much about so that's really good to hear and something to kind of keep an eye out for um hey od flow said where would mason mctavish be reselected in a redraft of the 2021 draft uh, okay, I'm going to go on EliteProspects.com, open the 2021 <laughs> draft, and refresh my memory get, here. Get those plugs in. Uh, okay, so I think uh, Power and Baneer still go one and two. Mm-hmm. I think, honestly, yeah, McTavish at number three, again, seems like a pretty justifiable pick because you have Kent Johnston, who is good, but not as multifaceted. Cole Sillinger, who should have absolutely not been in the position that he's been in. Uh Gunther, Eklund, no. Evanson, no. Yeah, three's fine. Yeah, three would be where it goes. I would imagine an NHL team would be like, no, Luke Hughes, but I think yeah. McTavish at three, Luke Hughes at four, and then you go from there. Seems okay. right. Yeah. Ken Pafu said, uh, what are your thoughts on Bo Aki if he's available for the Ducks at 59 or 60th overall? Whoever this dude is, I love you. You're a great person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the uh, Bo is Bo rules uh, he's he's uh the best rush defender in the entire draft just so smooth you know we, we you know when you watch your hockey and you see a defenseman like swipe at the puck 85 times before it gets it Bo Aki doesn't do that he's stick on puck every single time no extra movement so smooth so fluid great skater loves to jump into the play he's still working on the finer points of the offensive game but you see sort of these high-end flashes from him so yeah he'd be a great pick with that early second rounder 33rd i think we ranked him 32nd actually okay and so yeah he would be he'd be great there real high upside swing with a high likelihood of playing just because he can kill every play within a 10 foot radius yeah uh that was our, our good friend tony who's been a longtime supporter of us so he's a uh, He's going to live that up, you saying that about him. And he had a follow-up question. Is Passage of an NHLer? Um, I mean, you're talking to the wrong guy here. I was watching some old Michigan tape, and I saw both of the Passage jobs on the same line, and I was like, this <laughs> this isn't the hockey for me. But in all seriousness, <laughs> I, I like. I think I've come around on Passage job a little bit this season. Mm-hmm. I think I see more playmaking, more proactivity to his game. I don't see him as this sort of selfish shooter who doesn't really have mm-hmm. any other ways to influence a game anymore. Um, yeah, he could be a mid six scorer, I think. Uh, the skating is going to yeah. be the question. The pace is going to be a big question. There's always the chance that he's kind of the, one of those empty calorie point getters. So, you know, you stick him on like Arizona or something and he just piles up the points, but elsewhere he's going to have a more difficult time. But yeah, it's kind of a 50 50 thing for me at this stage. Warming up, still not convinced. Okay. And sorry uh, if you're listening, Sasha. I apologize. For you. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, you can post yeah. me in an Instagram reel in a few years when you score an overtime winner. <laughs> there, there, there it is. Uh, Shocking 911 want to follow up on the question about McTavish being reselected and say, where would you put him at uh, talent level wise, or basically where he would be drafted in this year's draft? 
Oh man, I, I gotta get. I, you know, gotta give me these questions in advance. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay, you, so let me. I, I will. I will do some more quick you, elite prospecting over here. You can just shoot from the hip, and we time. won't hold it, hold you to it. Yeah. No, I will see. The thing is, I'll, I'm gonna wake up at like 3 a.m. in the morning and be like, Oh, <laughs> oh my god, oh, I can't no. believe that I ranked Ryan Leonard below him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say you probably with McTavish, you stick him somewhere seventh to seventh to ninth, maybe. Okay. okay. So uh, elite prospects, we got uh, five is Benson, six is Leonard, and then from there he can fit in anywhere. Okay. Um, so Winterborn asks in an episode of CH go, Mike Donaghy, uh, Blackhawks director of amateur, amateur scouting clearly stated that he thought this draft had two generational talents in both Bedard and Fantilli. What are your thoughts on this? And have you heard this statement uh, or sentiment echoed elsewhere? Uh, yeah, it's true. I think so. I think maybe not, maybe not generational, but okay. certainly like guy who was great top end pick. It's really just semantics though. So like, and he is certainly, you know, he's one of the best first overall or one of the best prospects we've had in recent years, clearly a first overall caliber. So yes. Okay. And we have two more questions and then we'll, we'll get on out of here. Uh, Cause I know it's starting to get late for you. Uh, Ferdi ducks asks uh, the ducks were able to select uh, or able to pick Zellweger in the second round in large part because he was very young for his draft class and therefore a bit further back in his development. Uh, he definitely would have been a high first round pick if he was a week younger, fell into the following year's draft class. Any players that might fit that, mo- uh, that model in the upcoming draft? Uh, so young players, young, young who... player that probably is going to be drafted too low. Young player who's probably going to be drafted too low. Okay. I'm just trying to do some math here in my head and figure out the ages <laughs> of these players. Uh, is, Oh, I don't, I don't know. This is, this is a great question. I think maybe we should do player who is less physically mature because at the end of the day, the, it's That's ultimately true. about, it's yeah. all, it's ultimately about physical maturity. Grayson yeah. Souchin is obviously a great example of this. Someone who is very thin, but is very physically capable in board battles and so on. So he's a guy who could really thrive. You could look at Jaden Perron in the mid rounds. If he gets there as sort of a thinner, but high skill player who could really take off. Bo Akey comes to mind. Nick Lardis comes to mind. And then there's always, um, in terms of like guys who have a lot more room to grow, uh, maybe Carter Southern, who is big. He's a little bit more physically mature, but he's very raw in his decision making and his reads. But you see some very exciting high end flashes from him. So those would be my guys. Oh, and Easton Cowan. Shout out to Easton Cowan, who's one of the smarter forwards in the draft. Uh, lots of playmaking skill. Don't know if he's a Ducks guy, but certainly as someone who you could pick and then in a few years time could grow into being a real pleasant surprise. Awesome. And then the final question, uh, this is one that involves me, but uh, Connor Plutko said, uh, Mitch, who's getting drafted first, Oliver Moore or Gabe Perot? Him and I have a bet on uh, a beer bet on who's going to be taken first based upon some lists that we've been seeing and discussions we've had. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a really great question because <laughs> the, there are teams who really like more and there are teams who are like more is a three C. Why would I take him top 15? And so mm. I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go full recency bias here and say Perot goes over more. Oh, yes. That's my side of it. Oh, that's right. Okay. Jake was saying that. Yeah. Who, wh- which prospect do you prefer out of the two? Uh, well, I think more could arguably be the best prospect out of the development program. I know he doesn't have the scoring totals, but certainly in terms of skill, he's right there with Leonard Perot and, and, and Smith. It's more of like, he doesn't have the perfect ideal situation and his game can be a little bit hectic and pacey, but with that level of skating, that speed, that work rate, he's a very Dylan Larkin esque player. So you're going to have to teach him sort of the nuances of like how to use the speed, you know, when to cut back, when to drive how to get pressure on his back, how to manipulate opponents. But like he can do all those things just at a little bit less frequency than his line mates. So yeah, I mean, you could, I, I see a top, I see you could pick him sixth. And I think that'd be a great pick to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably, he's probably mm-hmm. just going to be a third liner because I like him. So, you know, <laughs> that's the way the world works, right? It's all about me. But uh, <laughs> his yeah, I, so I don't, impressive. Yeah. It's, it's crazy, man. Like the speed that he generates, like some of these, I was going through just like watching all of our more speed clips that I have saved. And it's like, the <laughs> guy was like five meters in front of him, uh, I guess like 12 feet to do this, do this thing. And like, he'll just, or whatever it is, I don't know, 15 feet, whatever. And he just like overcomes the deficit, like instantaneously. Like he just teleports on people. And it's like, I don't know where, and they don't know what to do. 
it's it's really jaw dropping watching him skate. There's a lot of prospects in this draft where I watch their clips and they do something that's just like wow, yeah, I've never seen someone like like watching Michkov like assist highlights. Yeah, and we haven't talked about him too much, but yeah, we haven't talked about him because I don't think the Ducks are thinking about him <laughs> very much. Nope. Uh, but he's yeah, his assists are just something else. Okay, we should probably stop it here. Um, well, before we get out of here. Mitch, you should tell everyone how they can support you, uh, where they can find you, things like that. Uh, plug away. So you can follow me at Mitchell Brown on Twitter.com. I've been posting videos of prospects lately, just using all the clips that I've saved over this season, and then also some stat stuff. And then you can go to EPRinkside.com. We're posting breakdowns on players. We'll have a video on our YouTube channel of Fantilli at some point. I think it'll be David St. Louis who does it. And then... We also have a draft guide that is 1,600 pages. Some might say that it's too long, to which someone who wrote a lot no. of it. I agree, but also <laughs> I'm Never not enough. apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> and so it has a little bit of something for everyone. If you want kind of like a draft guide that just gives you a brief preview into what the players do, most of the profiles are built like that. If you just want how good are they tools-wise, we have all the players have grades, all 400 and something of them. We have... All the information you could ever possibly want, I think. And if you still want more, you can go to the game reports or you can just message me or whatever. The draft guide is available with an Elite Prospects premium subscription, which is 12 US dollars per month. Or if you sign up for an annual subscription, which also gets you EP ringside and all of our written work, that is great. And I would highly recommend checking it out. You can get 50% off. Draft guide comes with it. It's a great deal, in my opinion. So I would really appreciate it if you check that out. Yeah, I mean... You know, just to vouch for elite prospects, because seeing what's going on today with some of the layoffs around the sports media world, um, elite prospects is to me it has become the number one place where I go for. for It's the go to for me. Yeah, like all you guys are missing is a podcast at this point. Like that's that's the missing link, and and you've got the trifecta. Like you're you're, you you've got me on the hook permanently if that happens. But real like all all kidding aside, like the, the 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 draft guide is so detailed. And like you said, there's mm-hmm. something in there for everyone because if you're someone who just wants quick, digestible information, it's there. You've got rankings. You've got I love the rankings of each tool. I think that's fantastic. But if you really want to get into the nuance, you've got the game reports. I mean, uh, you can really get in there. The players have their quick hitting tools, and I think Fantilli's one of them was got that dog in them. Yeah, I love that one. That that that's my favorite one. Um, and then EP Rinkside. I mean, the articles that are going up there constantly, and it's not just the prospect world, but the NHL world. Uh, it is it is absolutely worth it. So can't can't vouch for that enough. Um, but on that note, so Mitch, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it, and hopefully we'll have you back on. You know, it won't be a year this time. Uh, I, th- I think has it been a year or is it eleven months? I don't it, know. It's something like that. It was when my internet was out and I was in and out, and it was just YouTube oh, yeah. for most of it. Oh, it's yeah, a good time. You... <laughs> it's a good time. Yeah, that fun, was fun. fun days. Uh, but yeah, would, but if, don't, don't mind me. I was just sitting there waiting. It was raining for 11 months, looking at my window longingly, <laughs> wondering when Jake and Felix would message me to let me come uh, back yeah. on the podcast oh, yeah, and I'm share sure. all of my thoughts. It was a really tough time. Well, I'm sure. To yeah. your credit, we have people saying that you need to become the third member on this podcast in our Twitch there chat. You go. So, yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to get phased out uh, pretty quickly here. Yeah. <laughs> um this is anyway. why i'm not starting a podcast so i have time that i can join you guys yeah and well, on top of that and on top of that i don't want to be another white dude with a podcast but like that's not weird <laughs> that's a great point <laughs> oh yeah that is the best um yeah the, well elite prospects had a podcast and then it, it disappeared and hmm. I, i'm I, I am the one sitting by the window you know as it's raining <laughs> waiting for the, the podcast to, to return um also what i love about the draft guide this is now completely an aside but is that JD Burke has almost like a little personality description of every scout on the team in there. Like, I think he had, he had David St. Louis kind of described as a guy who's putting his, uh, like stream of consciousness in your guys' slack and, and loves a good prospect debate. I don't know if you can, if you can vouch for that or disagree with that, but I, I thought that was really funny. Oh, that, that's in the ranking explanation and you're never going to guess who wrote that. Oh, was it you? No, it was David. David wrote that about himself. <laughs> I, I I edited it and I was like, man, his self awareness is really good. Like he Wow. <laughs> yeah, this is it's true. He always is just like he'll be like, This dude is the best prospect I've ever seen in my life. 
And I'm like, okay, how many t- how 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 many games have you watched? And he's like, oh, I'm like two shifts into my first game. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. And then, yeah, then it's just mostly like controlling the roller coaster, right? You wanna, you wanna gently guide him in the, and you wanna gently guide him so he can not give himself a uh, hot take induced whiplash, and you know, just kind of let him do his thing. And yeah, he's he's great. I I love him a lot. Just like his intensity and just like the the rapid fire takes that he gives you makes it fun and interesting. Oh, that's great, yeah, Mitch. That's- we're getting a request in our Twitch chat for you, and I know we're trying to wrap this up, but. We've been known to have hot food takes. By we, I mean Felix. Do you have any food takes that are hot takes that you want to get out here? We are your canvas for this. Like, like anything unpopular that unpopular opinions, any, unpopular opinions. I think anything that you've wanted to get off your chest and put out there. Yeah. Okay. So oatmeal is the worst food that has ever existed. Oh, that's why? a good one. That's a fantastic okay, so, one. So, so oatmeal is just like imagine, <laughs> I, I, imagine if you just like picked up sludge from the bottom of the ocean you're like you know what i'm gonna put this in the microwave and then you eat it like this is this is this is this this is a sign that you can't cook if you're a big oatmeal person as someone i I love cooking it's my (laughs) thing i cook multiple times a day and you know what is the one thing that i will never cook it's oatmeal What, what about overnight oats same thing like like the ones like the ones where you eat it cold yeah, exactly. Like you, yeah. you just put it in a fridge and you eat it cold. You, you let it sit overnight. You put... thing, that is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of. Man. My partner, I, I feel my partner is from my partner is from Denmark, the country of <laughs> eating nothing but oatmeal and potatoes. Oh wow! And she did over. Oh, she did overnight no, overnight oats, and she's like, "No, this is a bridge Man. too far for me. <laughs> I can't do this." And I, I personally, I think oatmeal in general is a bridge too far for food. You know, we can you can do anything with food. You can eat anything you want. You can you can you can put mustard on tortilla chips and then put chocolate on top of them and eat it. I think that's disgusting, but I won't judge you for it. But oatmeal, man, you just you just can't. And then people are like, okay, this is the best part of the oatmeal people. I told you, they're go like, off, go off. They're like, let, let okay, cook. you know what I'm gonna do with my oatmeal? I'm gonna make it distinctly not oatmeal. They're like, okay, I'm gonna put three <laughs> tablespoons of cinnamon in this. Yeah. I'm gonna put a bunch of chocolate. I'm gonna put a bunch of peanut butter in it, and then it's just like, just make a cookie. Just make cookies. That's what you're yeah. trying to eat. That's Thank what you, you want. It'll be it's the dessert. same caloric intake, the same macronutrients. Just eat that instead. <laughs> Wait, Man. so do you hate oatmeal cookies then? No, I love oatmeal cookies. It's okay. the only practical okay. use of oats. Okay, it's wow. the only way that oats should be used that I haven't currently. You know, <laughs> oatmeal? Or maybe there's something. Else. This is an all-time crash the pond moment i think i yeah. mean i haven't even i oh, oat milk rules yeah oat milk is okay good. okay I, I mean i have an even hotter take food wise i go feel for like it oatmeal one was met. okay so so this is this is a classic one that is going to piss off a lot of people who are into hockey but you know what go you know it. what absolutely sucks steak steak is terrible steak is steak Ooh, wow is, steak is, people people go out and they're like you know what i'm gonna have i just really want a 200 dollars steak uh and it's like Okay, first off, it all comes from the same animal. Wow. Second, second part of it is, anytime you go to a restaurant, someone who has worked in a restaurant cooking steaks, <laughs> no one knows actually how to cook a That's, steak. That, that, is that is a fair point. That is true. I remember, and on top of that too, people actually don't know what they, what they want in a steak. I'd cook a steak, perfect, perfect, perfect medium. And they'd be like, this is, this is medium rare. I don't want this. And it's like, no, it's a perfect medium. So what you wanted was medium well, and you wanted to pretend. Actually, I, I've shifted my argument. I'm wow. now, I'm just reliving all of my restaurants. There's a lot of drama. issues here. That, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. This is so, all about so, steak, it seems. This We're is, your food is, therapy is right now. This is, yeah, this is, this is deeper. So people go in, you know, they're like, you know what? I, I'm staying there over, over the charbroiler. I'm 20 years old. I'm like nine hours into my shift. I'm wearing a ball cap because it doesn't fit me. I'm sweating. <laughs> People are yelling at me constantly all the time. I've cooked 500 steaks. Every single time a steak comes, every single time a steak comes back, it's the only time that I actually cook the steak to the right temperature. And somehow they're mad at me for it not being right. And then you have people who are like, you know what? I'm gonna k- put ketchup on this steak. Oh, oh don't get me started. Okay, on ketchup. yeah. And don't it's like, okay, if you have, if you're a well done steak person, then I guess ketchup is acceptable because then you're yeah. just eating meat fries. It's a hamburger like, at that point. But like, what, what's the point of having a well done steak anyway? <laughs> there is none. And there is like, no, no. And, and you, you can just the only acceptable, and I'll, I'll take this. The, uh, the other acceptable uses for steak, or the only acceptable uses for steak, are generally if like you make 
tacos with the steak. You do something nice with the steak. Okay. You cut it up into pieces. You fry it up nicely. You put a nice sauce on top of it. Okay, then you okay. eat it in a tortilla. That that that's that's good. That's good steak eating. Or I maybe, appreciate. Maybe... I appreciate saving saving carne asada tacos right there. Yeah, yeah, okay. of course. Like this, this is. I actually, I actually just made El Pastor tacos. I did. I wow. layered it up with. I made it. I piled it up in a big tin, layered it with bake in between, made a nice marinade out of guajillos and ancho chilies, and there you it go. was great. Wow. And this is this is people people who want nothing more than to eat steak. This is what you need to try. You need to try making real civilized people food, and you'll <laughs> feel much better about yourself. That's just wow. it. Man, that I might that, go make some overnight oats after this. That was it. That was a heel turn. That was all <laughs> I don't even. I don't even know where you live, Jake. But I'll. You'll. You'll just. You'll just don't. wake up in the middle of the night. I'll just kicked in your door or something like that and be like, so, "No, don't eat oatmeal." I'll be no. checking the ring all night. Don't worry. Oh, I had a question for you. Actually, <laughs> I was just in Canada. I don't know if you're a candy person, but how would you power rank like Canadian candy, specifically like the chocolate bars? Because I feel like, you know, coffee, coffee crunch. Uh, you know, arrow, like there's a Kit Kat, like there, there's a lot of different types here. And I'm, I'm curious, what's the consensus here? Uh, people need to learn how to bake stuff. That's, that's my thoughts okay. on that. Okay. People, people <laughs> need to learn, people need to learn how to make like cookies or something. I can get, I can just, you know, I got all, I got so many recipes buried and buried in this brain. All I think about is food. It's all I know. Wow. I just, my entire, Pro- I wake prospects up and, and food. Prospects that, that, and yeah. Food. Literally, literally every single day is what can I make for food? What unreasonable take can I have about prospects? <laughs> and then it sounds like this, this this podcast was meant to be today. Basically, this doesn't sound that <laughs> unfamiliar, honestly. If I have to rank them, though, I would say you're probably Coffee Crisp is actually good. Okay, that's so a good take. Coffee Cri- Coffee Crisp is the baseline. We'll go below or above Coffee Crisp. Oh. Arrow definitely below, definitely mm, below. I don't know if I agree with that, but continue. Crispy Crunch definitely above. Uh, okay. is, is Mr. Big a Canadian thing? Uh, I don't know. I was in Montreal, so I, you know I don't know what's available I, there. I've never heard of yeah. it, so sure. Yeah. Okay, I Miss Mr. Big is definitely below caramel, below. Wow. Uh, below. Okay. Anyway, this is your ranking. This is your time. I'm not going to step in. I mean, really, really, all of these, <laughs> all of these though, just all of these though, are kind of mediocre. Like, They're all you know, better you, than you, American you, candy. I promise you. You that. can eat them and you can feel better, you know, momentarily. But then you're just going to be like, I should have just had something better. Yeah, that that is true. That is, I I bought a bunch at like the dollar store in like on, on the roadside in Quebec before leaving, uh, and now yeah, I'm eating them and I'm like, this is why am I doing this to myself? Why did I buy all this? But it's okay. It's better than the candy here. The American candy is just not all that. It's European fine. is way better. European chocolate. They, they got yes. these. So if you go, if you go to yeah, that's fair. You can get you can get like these marabou bars is what they're called. They're gigantic and they're cheap. And they have like Oreo ones. They have dime, which is like a score kind of thing. Okay. And the chocolate okay. is way better. They're way tastier. You get a bigger one relative to the price. Yeah, highly recommend that. And in, in North America, we're just like. We yeah. just accept the lowest quality of food. Like yeah. we just our expectations, man. Oh, like, so low. Like we we Trash. accept the worst possible stuff. Like I'm sure in Europe, even oatmeal is better. I'm sure even even a oatmeal hater like me, the only strong stance that I have in my life is oatmeal. If someone <laughs> was running for this province as a single issue, uh, uh, as a single Can't issue, a uh, single issue candidate. And it was to ban oatmeal. I would vote for them. It's as Fair. simple as that. Fair. Even I, even I can acknowledge oatmeal probably is probably better in Europe. That ma- that makes you probably like a lot of voters. You know, one issue I agree with. Okay, boom, vote. You, you've got my vote. <laughs> yeah, I just I just live this in Alberta, where it's like people are like, hmm. Yes, the incumbent has said all sorts of terrible things. Is racist. Is a terrible human being. <laughs> but. She did say one time that oil and gas is good for the province. Maybe we should save Boom. that. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that sounds about right. So, some things are true everywhere. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's sounds familiar. Pe- people voting for an industry that they don't even work in. You know, it's like oh yeah, it's like the coal miners in the United States. Like twenty thousand people yeah. fall under this thing, and it's like leading, and it's like leading debates during the Clinton Trump. Yeah. it's like come on yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's how it goes unfortunately anyway my real hot take here is that is oatmeal sucks and steak is overrated steak unless is... used in the correct context 
steak th- that one I, I don't know i'm having trouble i'm having trouble getting there with that one but I, yeah. i'm more of a vegetarian myself though okay like that is some that, okay. i don't i don't that, I don't that makes more sense vegetarian. now i don't eat exclusively vegetarian but i i am certainly i do lean that i know i just said that i made out past we're talking about I, I was about to say yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> like it's i i am uh i'm what what do they call it a flexitarian yeah that's that's what that's what i am <laughs> nice nice so i i eat whatever i want and then i say that actually i'm eating consciously yeah. and responsible and, yeah and then i try to rub it in people's faces but if you look behind my eyes you can tell that i'm lying well it, it's like you just uh, see meat it's like people on <laughs> it's like people on keto you know it's like yeah. and then and then, didn't, and then they'll wait say didn't that, you do keto like a couple years ago yeah, but the thing is, keto. That's the, it seems like the best source for it. Then <laughs> that's fair. Pe- people will say they're on keto, but then they'll say I'm following the eighty twenty rule, and it's like, well, <laughs> keto is actually one that you can't really do that. Like it's it's kind of more of the hundred zero oh, and all in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's the people who go to restaurants as someone who's experienced this, and they're like, yeah, I, I'm 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 I need to eat gluten free, and it's like, well, are you celiac? And they're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. Like I generally prefer gluten free just because I like I think I have a mild intolerance, but I don't go around saying like, oh yeah, I have celiacs or or whatever. So anyway, this this is this is a rabbit hole I did not think. This we'd, went we'd off the rails to. in the most like on brand way for us, I think. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm being corrected on my my keto take here in our chat. I'm aware that you can eat carbs on keto, but you need to be on keto to remain to <laughs> maintain the benefits of keto. You need to remain in ketosis. Anyway. <laughs> No one cares about that, uh, but everyone. I, mean, should I care about this deeply, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but anyway, anyone should. Everyone should go check out uh, Mitch's work. Everyone should go check him out on Twitter. Go check out all the prospects. Highly recommend. If you want to support our show, uh, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, check out our Patreon, Patreon.com/slash/CrashThePond. And on that note, uh, we will talk to you next week. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Bye.